Let me begin with a story. We sat at the top of the Capitol building steps. They were white marble steps. And we're, we were looking down at all of the people walking by. The sun was shining and the spring buds had just begun to make their appearances. At that moment, moment, no one could disrupt us as we observed the hundreds of students and teachers walking hurriedly by. We acted like we knew what they were thinking. We even pretended to have conversations for them. A group of girls we imagined were talking about the hot guys they met at the bar the other night. An older man and a young student looked like they were in deep discussion about quantum physics. A couple walked by in a lab coats, and we imagined that they were mad scientists quarreling about their last experiments. It was an innocent afternoon that left an indelible impression on my mind. The laughter, the imagination, and the hope-filled possibilities were all there to become the foundational, foundational elements of over 25 years of love and trust. Who knew that those few moments on the steps where we were finding our commonality by observing other people's differences would lead to this life together? Now, if you've ever met, if you've ever had the chance to meet my husband, you will discover that he is nearly a complete opposite of me. He is about six feet two tall, and I am clearly not. He has a Swedish German background and sports a sandy blonde mop that looks fashionably long. I have parents who were born and raised in the Philippines and came to the US before I was born. His family dates back to the Mayflower. In fact, his father's side of the family claims to be part of the lineage that are known as the Daughters of the Mayflower. We are so clearly physically different very few would have put us together back then, and some people still have a hard time putting us together today. And yet, in spite of all of our differences, we found enough in common threads to have tied us together for over 25 years. I'm not exactly sure how this whole chemistry stuff works, but it did today, and because of that, we have two beautiful children to show how well it worked. So today's lecture is Just Like Me, the era of likeness in a global world full of differences. Now, um, when I said yes to this a year ago, I think I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to share from both research, observations, and life experiences back then. But then, you know, life happens, and uh, when I started preparing, I completely forgot why I said I was gonna talk about this particular lecture to Dr. Byler. So bear with me as I sort of weaved my way back and forth to what I meant when I said yes. I'm sure none of you seminary students forgot what you wrote about last semester, right? I mean, you know every single paper you've written about. But here's what I do remember about this topic and why it was so important to me um, was the reality of the world where we were about a year ago. You see, in 2019, the world that I was working with and in and engaged with felt like a very divided world. When I went to the Ukraine for the Eurasia Mission Summit, they were trying to find a way to bring peace between the Russians and the Ukrainians. When I wandered in the United Methodist circles of ministry, there were very clear divisions between the conservatives and the liberals. And when I watched the news, the political groups were making their disdain for one another clearly known. It was very public and very divisive. Everywhere I looked, groups were only trusting people who were just like them. And most of those homogenous communities of people were very suspicious and skeptical of any other groups who didn't share their ideological thoughts, their values, or even their political views. It was as if their tribes were much more important than the vision of God's kingdom. 
But then I remembered the vision I saw at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas. It was this piece of art called the Plexus Number no. 27 by Gabriel Dawes. When you came down the spiral staircase at Crystal Bridges, you could see this beautiful creation of color. But as you looked closer, you could see that this image was created by thousands and thousands of strands of string that were carefully connected with millions of tiny hooks. It was breathtaking in my mind. And every step you took up or down the stairs, you would see a new view with new colors. And it made the visual art even more mesmerizing. To me, it became the inspiration for my book on trust that both values the differences that each person brings to a relationship while also recognizing the gifts for our connections through faith, hope, and love, which leads to greater trust. So that's what I want to share with you today. What will it take for us to move away from the just-like-me era to the divine likeness, the vision that God has in store for us in both the here and now and the yet to come? Let me first begin by offering a few observations about life in this world today. We are clearly living in a coronavirus world, AKA COVID-19. If you weren't talking about it in your way in, then I'm sure you've been talking about it in church. Has anybody seen this new greeting for passing the peace? <laughs> Live long and prosper, right? Or there's another great one on Facebook, which is instead of coming up and shaking, do the toe touch dance, right? Like toe touch. It is a very different and surreal world, right? What is this current experience of the world teaching us about humanity today? Well, in my observation, here's what I see. We are living in fear. We are living in the era of fear that seems to be unprecedented. COVID-19 has been declared now by the World Health Organization as a pandemic. Number two, we are living in a world where we are beginning to feel the real results of our interconnected world. Technology, media, communication, they've impacted the way we are uncovering and sharing information whether it be right ways or wrong ways. Travel, industry, many of the things that we've sort of taken for granted in our sort of industrial world has been completely disrupted by this outbreak. And as you know, even if you have family and friends in Europe, there's no way they can enter the US today. Number three, we are more alike than we know. No country, no community, no culture has been immune to this potential disease. If you are human, this could affect you. And it will take the solidarity, collaboration, and trust of all, all people to mitigate and contain this invisible threat to all. So, whether we like it or not, COVID-19 is teaching us about what it means to be connected and affected by our relationships in a global world. We're being forced to see more of our commonalities and pressed and challenged to set aside our differences. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, from the east or from the west, from the north or the south, this situation is changing us, transforming us, and forcing us to pay attention to our divine likeness. Now, that's not exactly what I imagined a year ago when I fir first set the title for this lecture. But the Holy Spirit kind of works in some mysterious and wonderful ways, right? So here we are today. And in light of this divine likeness, I'd like to turn towards trust. We must trust humanity as a whole 
And we must find trust, find ways to trust each human being to do what is right for the sake of the human race. And so, here we go this morning. Let's explore what it means to navigate trust in a world full of global differences. Trust. Our world cannot operate without it. And yet, we continuously bemoan and complain about how little trust exists in our world today. I've been fascinated by this concept for several years, but even more as I continue to observe the world around me. On the one hand, I agree with the naysayers and the pessimists who have given up on the world and given up on any hope that humanity will do the right thing to take care of one another and to take care of the fragile communities where we interact. I mean, think about it. How many of our schools have closed their doors, have stopped classes, have moved towards online, and what is behind that? Because they don't trust people who are sick to stay home. And so, here we are. We don't trust one another to do the right thing. On the other hand, I find it impossible to navigate the world without some layers of trust that must exist for people to live in community. So what is it? What is it that makes us operate in a world built on trust, trust and yet act and speak like it doesn't even exist in our communities today? What challenges us as we constantly think about where trust is needed and where trust is broken? Why should the church even care about a world with or without trust? As we think about our divine likeness in our lecture today, I'd like to wonder out loud about some of these questions and to attempt to bring some research to the conversation. I invi invite you to wonder with me. I would encourage you to explore what also might be some possible responses that could help each of us take away some new learnings that will help us regain and reestablish the church, the churches and church leaders' roles in the realms of trust in the world today. How are we, as church leaders, learning to trust? How are we, as church leaders, exercising trust and being the trustworthy people God needs us to be in the world today? So as you heard, the introduction of this lecture was a reflection about an afternoon date with my husband. And it was when we experienced first our first explorations of our relationship together. The reason I use this reflection is because it had several components that affected the ways in which we learned to trust one another. We were offering tidbits of information about ourselves to each other. We were honest, open, and sincere with one another, especially in that moment. And we became vulnerable with each other, sharing our observations of others in both silly and serious ways. In the end, we showed one another that we cared about, each o about what each other was thinking. Ultimately, those first few dates were the building block for the foundation that has led to our relationship over 25 years. I chose our relationship as an illustration because, like the church, it is a voluntary relationship. Did you think about that? Like the church, it's a voluntary relationship. A relationship where we were not bound by the cultural expectations of blood relatives that comes with the biological family, right? Instead, we chose to be in relationship together. Now, some would say that in the church association, it's not necessarily voluntary, right? Your parents said you had to go to this church for the rest of your life. But for this particular purpose, let's agree that the church is a voluntary association for most people in the US context. And even though we were quite different, it was our common love and care for one another that kept us together. And it was our vision of hope for our future that continues to build upon the foundations of trust in our relationship.
Charles Feltman is an author and coach who wrote the book, The Thin Book of Trust, an essential primer for building trust at work. This book was primarily for business leaders. However, I believe this book has many applicable nuggets of knowledge about trust that are relevant for the church and our religious and spiritual organizations. He says, trust is, a funda is fundamental to our sense of safety, autonomy, and dignity as human beings. It's an integral part of every single relationship we have. This is one of the reasons I make the argument that trust is inherently part of God's divine design. We could not operate in this world without some sense of trust, whether it's to be trusting whether it's to be trusting our doctors to be open and honest with us about their observations and diagnosis for our health, or it be about trusting teachers to have done their due diligence in sharing the knowledge and expertise that they've gained in their fields. When we're accepting of the divine design that God has established and interwoven into each and every human being, the Imago Dei, then we trust that there is a likeness in humanity that can bring us together in successful, thriving, and flourishing communities throughout the world. It's this human likeness that moves us towards engaging in the world with a greater sense of trust. So what is it that makes people voluntarily trust each other? What makes people voluntary tru voluntarily trust participating and engaging in communities? What makes us trust institutions? companies, organizations, or governments. Everyone operates in the world with some layers of trust that are offered to one another in order to operate in a social context, day in and day out. You can't drive a car anywhere without some trust that your fellow drivers will follow the rules, right? You trust that they're gonna stop at the stop sign when you go through. So the, there are a few basic principles of trust that we all operate in and we navigate. Some trust is influenced by the law. Other elements of trust are influenced by cultural norms and expectations, and more critical elements of trust are influenced by feelings, understandings, and commitments. The realm of trust which we will explore is the realm of voluntary trust. Voluntary trust is driven by three critical aspects, I believe. The social context where you live, your personal psychological aspect, and, your, and um, where you live, your personal psychological aspect and your guiding principles, moral values, or theological beliefs. Any one of these aspects can be a greater influence than the other in a multitude of realms. For example, the threat of COVID-19 disease. And the communication about this disease means that we are being heavily influenced by the social contexts of trust, right? The World Health Organization is a credible and trustworthy nonpartisan organization that has been telling all communities in their social contexts where we live that they must take extra precautions to protect all of the people who are interconnected in societies through this outbreak. Not only is this appeal for the general public, but even more so for the most vulnerable amongst us, right? This isn't just about you and me, but it's about caring for those who are the most vulnerable among us. They're asking communities to extend care to one another. So Charles Feltman argues that there are four primary assessments that are made in order for people to extend and offer trust to one another. The distinctions in these assessments are as follows. Sincerity. Sincerity is the assessment that you are honest, that you say what you mean and mean what you say. You can be believed and taken seriously. It also means when you express an, op an opinion, it is valid, useful, and is backed up by sound thinking and evidence. Finally, it means that your actions will align with your words. Sincerity. Reliability. It's the assessment that you meet the commitments you make 
and that you keep your promises. You know, your teachers will trust you more if you turn in your papers on time, right? <clears throat> You're a reliable student. Competence. It's the assessment that you have the ability to do what you are doing or that you propose to do. You actually know how to preach, right? So then your pastors and your, your church members believe and trust that you are competent in that way. And I believe this last one is the most important. Care. Care is the assessment that you have the other person's interests in mind, as well as your own, when you make decisions and you take actions. Of these four assessments of trustworthiness, Feltman goes on to say, care is in some ways the most important for building lasting trust. When people believe you are only concerned with your own self-interest and you don't consider the interests of others as well, they may be able to trust your sincerity, your reliability, and your competence. But they will tend to limit their trust of you to specific situations and transactions. However, when people believe you hold their interest in mind, they will extend their trust with you more broadly. So I want to take a minute to watch this video. And while you're walking or watching it, I want you to think about those four elements of trust. Where did you see an illustration of sincerity, reliability, competence, and care? Take my hand. All right, did you see all four elements in that? Try me, who saw sincerity there? Okay, I'm, I'm not really good at these kind of lecture things, so I'm more of an educated, you know, like an engaged. So anybody see uh, sincerity in that? Sincerity in the father, yeah, as he <laughs> offered his, you earned my trust. How about reliability? You got him there on time. <laughs> Competence? He was riding that bicycle. He figured out a way to get her there on time. He saw the watch she was wearing, and that reminded him what he needed to do, and he did it. Exactly. He got there. He got there. He, he was competent to get there. And what about care? Yes, thank you, he did. He cared about their relationship with both of them. With all four of these, our essential trust assessments may be useful not only in the workplace, sorry, I think I just totally skipped to where I was at. <laughs> and this is why I don't do lectures, <laughs> no. Um, but I really believe that this is what God has offered us also in spiritual guidance and foundational faith stories that remind us how critical trust is for discovering God's gifts of the divine likeness in our world today. So not only are those four assessments critical and important, but when we begin to think about God and God's ways of working with us, we move it into our spiritual language, right? We, we begin to experience and extend the Christian moral virtues of faith, hope, and love. Those are the virtues that also are foundational in our understanding of trust. So yesterday, I spent the day working with pastors and lay leaders in the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference, really unpacking this concept of trust, and it was so fun. So thank you, Susan, for that opportunity, and thanks to those of you who were present. But as we were doing that, um, we were trying to think of ways it really related to their practical everyday work. Today, I want to invite you to think theologically with me about trust through faith, trust through hope, and trust through love. And I believe that this will lead us to seeing the gift of the Imago Dei in each person we meet, even those who are least like us. We trust God because the Bible reminds us that God saw everything God made 
and it was supremely good. Right? Genesis 1, 31. If we trust the words in the Bible, then we must trust and have faith that creation is good. In fact, it is supremely good. And we are the created ones, right? So why do we trust that God will be faithful? Well, it's because we get glimpses of it every day. Think about creation. Each day, the sun rises, and each day, the sun sets. We can stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon or at the Appalachian Mountains, and we can think about the goodness of God's creation. We may wade to the shores near the ocean, and we marvel at how faithfully the tide rolls in and the tide rolls out. There is a faithful order to creation that makes us trust God's faithfulness. Even in the most concerting of times, like today, God will still be faithful. And with each witness to God's faithfulness, we will continue to build and strengthen our trust in God and our trust in humanity. Remember the stories of Moses. Remember the stories of Moses and the people in the wilderness. When they were hungry, God provided the manna from heaven. When they needed the water, God provided the stream from the stone. When they needed the meat, God provided the birds in abundance. Story after story in the Bible, we are reminded of God's faithfulness, even when humanity failed to be faithful to God. God remained faithful to creation. I have the gift um, and the blessing of traveling the world. And as I travel the world, I encounter story after story of God's faithfulness. And with each story, my trust in God's faithfulness continues to grow. I want to tell you about another story, about this young woman who took this leap of faith. She was going to trust God to care for her baby boy. So she had already had three pregnancies before, and all three of those pregnancies were lost. And she was very worried, because here she had the fourth child. And she thought, if I keep this child again, this baby will have the same consequence as the previous babies. So she, she gave this baby, in her mind, up to God. Very young, very unknown, she placed this baby in one of those um, bedpans, you know, a metal bedpan. And she placed him on the side of the road and she prayed that God would provide for this child and that God would be faithful to taking care of this baby. Now, she had no idea what would happen to that child. And she was very worried, but yet she prayed every day. And somebody did find that child. Somebody picked up that child and brought that child home and raised this child as her own. Interestingly enough, that child grew up until he was 10, year old, 10 years old believing that his aunt was his mother and that his aunt, his, um, his aunt was his aunt. But in reality, it was his mother, his biological mother. So her sister picked up this baby on the road, brought him home and nurtured him as if he were her own. Now, again, it was a symbol of God's faithfulness for that young woman in that time. But let me tell you, if it wasn't for her faithfulness in God to care for that, that young baby, I would not be standing here before you today. That was my father's story, and it was my grandmother who gave him up to God in an effort to say, God, I trust you. I know you will be faithful. 
God is faithful. Because of her trust in God's faithfulness, I am alive. So what is it about understanding trust through hope? I think hope is one of the premier foundations of trust in humanity. Because of hope, we are able to look for the good in one another. You see, hope helps us to be more united as a human race. It's through our hope in Jesus Christ that allows us the grace to extend hope to one another and to ourselves. Remember Romans 5, 25? We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him. And we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our own problems because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hope, my friends, is the orientation of the heart. You see, this kind of hope comes through our belief our faith, and our understanding in Jesus as the risen Christ, who overcomes death, adversity, and even despair and redeems all through the power of the resurrection. It is trusting that even in loss, even in despair, God can use our faithfulness, our circumstances, and our very lives to change the world. You see, Jürgen Moltmann describes this as active hope, in which he describes the nature of God being the God of hope. And out of this hope, we can act, trusting God's promises in our future. This is active hope that leads us to trust in God and even trust in one another. Even if our trust in one another seems to have failed, Time and time and time and time over and over again, we orient our hearts. We orient our hearts towards the everlasting hope we find in Jesus. That's who we are. That's what we do. Hope is a gift given by the Creator that we have the responsibility to steward, use, and share. I love hope stories. (laughs) Does anyone else love their hope stories? Hope stories for me are really what just energize me and give me so much hope. I love hope stories that lead to trusting God and trusting humanity even more. These hope stories give us a sense of connectedness to the human condition and the human ability to arise out of those conditions. That's why hope leads to trust. So let me share a little story of hope. And I, you know, be careful what you say to me because I pick up stories (laughs) and I grab them. But the other day, actually just yesterday, I was riding back with Amy Wagner from the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference. She's the congregational developer that sparked a whole lot of hope in me as we were driving back from Franklin. Now, I might get some of the pieces wrong because, like I said, it was in the drive back, but whatever it was, I captured this story. She was telling me about the Cove, which is this church in Avalon, and there's these stories of hope in this particular church. She was telling me about this young young woman who was very passionate about art, and she was telling me about the way that the sanctuary is shaped and how she has made these like little coves that used to be used for like Sunday school classrooms, you know, around the church to create little pockets of art spaces, right? Art spaces and art studios. So one little cove was devoted to drawing and painting. Another little cove was devoted to um, to sort of the like clay or you know those kinds of arts, and another cove towards towards video and um, stop art, you know, those like stop videos that people do. And she was telling me how this little art space has given the young people 
the youth in that community new hope because they found a space to come and be creative, to come and be able to, to learn about the Bible. And then she was telling me about this incredible um, lessons of the Bible that they're learning through by taking the book of Exodus and Luke, I think, and doing this comparison of reading Exodus and Luke and then using those stories to create art projects, right? Like, again, videos, art, all kinds of ways. And these young people are getting into the Bible, into the Word, in ways that they would have never done had it not been for this young woman's vision, the possibilities of where she could take these young people to give them hope, to remind them of who they are and to whom they belong. I mean, I don't know about you, but <laughs> those kinds of stories give me chills, remembering how God uses hope to build trust. So it's C.R. Snyder who talks about this hope theory. And I really believe that that particular story has all of these elements of C.R. Snyder's hope theory. He's a psychologist, right? And he says, we have hope when we clearly see the goal and the vision that we are after, right? So this young woman who had a very clear goal and vision of what she was after, a space to create for these young people, but not only was the goal and the vision important, but the pathway to how she was gonna get there and to bringing people along was critical. She needed to be able to see how was she gonna get there. And of course, it was her agency that was critical in the end in order for her to get there. It's one thing to have hope through a goal and a vision. It's another to be able to see the vision and the pathway it's even more important to know that you have the God-given gifts to bring the people along that path. You have the God-given gifts and the ability to move people forward towards that vision and hope. So that, that hope theory, I believe, are some of the incredible foundations of trust, right? We all need hope, and we all thrive when we have hope. It's part of our human condition, our divine DNA, and our spiritual likeness through God, our creator. The last thought I wanna leave you with is trust through love. Deepening our understanding of one another by discovering what it means to trust through love might be one of the most difficult dilemmas of our Christian faith. I don't always understand how God so loved us that God was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for us, even when we were and continued to sometimes be the most untrustworthy people. Maybe even when we were and sometimes continued to be the most unloving people. What is it about love that makes us do crazy things? I mean, there's a reason that the term crazy love exists, right? I mean, even the founder of Methodism did some crazy things when the one he loved didn't return his love. Anybody know that story? Remember his experience down in Georgia? For those of you who don't know, please ask your Methodist history professors about it, John Wesley's love life, and you will get an earful. Establishing trust through love should be the, be the easiest, right? It should be the easiest for us who profess Christianity because God is love. And yet, lost love can destroy trust. But when love is offered to the least of these, the power of trust through love can prevail. Remember the story of the Syrophoenician woman? Her devotion and her love for her daughter caused her, caused her to go into the presence of the Savior. Even when the society and their cultural practices told her 
She was not welcomed, nor was she allowed. But her love, her love caused her to take that risk, to go to Jesus. And that particular love caused Jesus to pause. Caused Jesus to pause and re-examine the cultural practices that he was being surrounded with in that time and place. It caused him to pause and remember the divine likeness that connected them, even though she was a woman who was not accepted in that place at that time. I want to leave you with another great story of how extreme love for one's neighbor can transform our understanding of trust. Here's some water. You want your toes? At first glance, 31-year-old Chris Salvatore and 89-year-old Norma Padovina look a bit like an odd. Friends, if we are not teaching, preaching, and preparing our churches to search for the divine likeness in everyone we meet, then we will be failing to be the people God has called us to be. If we are not teaching, preaching, and preparing Christian leaders to learn how to trust, exercise, and practice trust through faith, hope, and love, and to be trustworthy, we are failing to play our part in bringing about the kingdom of God in the world today. Searching for God's image in every human being we meet is essential. Finding ways to extend our trust to others and to be trustworthy for the sake of God's mission in the world is also essential. As the leaders of the World Health Organization have said over the past few days, it is time. It is time for us to act together. Act together in solidarity of the human race and for the human race. Let it not just be our response to COVID-19, where we set our differences aside and move toward solidarity. Let it be because of Christ's call. Christ's call on each and every one of us as Christians who worship a God of love. Amen? Amen. With that, I'll leave you with Wesley's quote, quote on differences and love. Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may, herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences.